Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ed Flynn. I am the City Council President. Viewers can watch the City Council meeting live on YouTube by visiting boston.gov slash citycouncil-tv. I'd like to ask my colleagues and those in the audience to please silence your cell phones and electronic devices. I'd also like to ask everyone to be respectful of each other and not disrupt the meeting while you are here. If you are disruptive, you will be asked to leave, and if you fail to comply, you'll be escorted out. Please also note that according to City Council rules, there are no signs allowed in the chamber. Please also note that our stenographer is working from home today, so even though she is not here in person, she is watching at home and transcribing the, the meeting. We're gonna do the roll call. Mr. Clerk, will you please call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum, please? Councilor Roy, Councilor Baker, Councilor Brady, Councilor Hello. Here. Councilor Blair, here. Councilor Lowe. Present. Councilor Mejia. Councilor Murphy. Here. And Councilor Worrell. Since we don't have a quorum, which is seven, we're in a brief recess until we have a quorum, and we'll start again when we have seven colleagues. But I do like to start right at exactly 12 o'clock. We're in a brief recess. Mr. Clerk, can we do the roll call to ascertain the presence of a quorum? Councilor Arroyo. Present. Councilor Baker. Here. Councilor Braden. Councilor Coletta. Councilor Durkin. Here. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flynn. Yeah. Councilor Lara. Councilor Louis Jean. Present. Councilor Mejia. Councilor Murphy. Here. And Councilor Worrell. Here. A quorum is present. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I have been informed by the clerk that a quorum is present. Mr. Clerk, I understand that you're going to give the opening, opening prayer today? Yes. Yeah, the, the chair recognizes the clerk. Good afternoon. Let us pray. We gather once again to do God's work, the work of peace. May we seek to renew a right spirit within our own souls and a right spirit among our sisters and brothers gathered here today so we might carry the spirit of God of peace into the world to relieve the suffering of all sentiment beings. Reaching inward, we prepare our hearts to be at peace, to work with our colleagues in peace and to bring peace to the world. We hear the words of our teachers, echoing the understanding and wisdom of our many spiritual traditions. And we now, as we turn to our work at this meeting, mindful of our cosmic companionship, let us pray with our actions for peace. May this be a reflection of the peace that resides in each of our hearts. May our greatest passion be compassion and our greatest strength be love. So may it be, amen. Thank you, Clark. Could you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Clark, can you ensure the record is reflected? Council Coletta is present.
We're on to the approval of the minutes, which is the first order of business. Seeing and hearing no discussion on the matter at this time, the chair moves to approve the minutes from the last meeting. All those in favor of approving the minutes from the last meeting, please say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Thank you. The minutes of the last meeting stand as approved. Communications from her honor, the mayor. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1700? Docket number 1700, message in order authorizing the city of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $4 million in the form of a grant for the MGH Clinical Building Project Grant awarded by the Boston Planning and Development Agency to be administered by the Public Works Department. The grant will fund studies to examine design changes and implement the reconstruction of Blossom Street from Cambridge Street to Charles Street. Thank you. Dockets 1700 will be referred to the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1701? Docket number 1701, message in order, authorization, authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $1,358,100 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 22 assistance to firefighters grant operation and safety awarded by the Federal Emergency Management Agency to be administered by the fire department. The grant will fund the procurement of personnel protective, personal protective equipment, bailout systems, and the training required to use uh, this PPE safely, as well as fund cancer and cardiac screening programs to provide early clinical detection of members. Thank you. This docket 1701 will be referred to the Committee on Public Safety, Criminal Justice. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1702, please? Docket number 1702, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $750,000 in the form of a grant for the MGH-BTD Clinical Building Project Grant awarded by the Policy and Planning in the Boston Planning and Development Agency to be administered by the Department of Transporta the Transportation Department. The grant will fund transportation studies to examine the design changes and improvements that can be made to Cambridge Street, Blossom, and North Grove Cambridge Street intersection. Thank you. This talk at 1700 will be referred to the Committee on Planning, Development, Transportation. Mr. Clerk, can you please read at 1703? Docket number 1703, message in order for your approval. An order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend a grant in, the, in, a, in an amount not to exceed $500,000 from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Executive Office of Environmental Affairs, Division of Conservation Services, Parkland Acquisitions and Renovations for Communities Program. The, this grant is awarded to the City of Boston through the Parks and Recreation Department for renovations to the Walsh Playground located at the neighborhood of Mattapan. Thank you. This docket 1703 will be referred to the Committee on Environmental Justice, Resiliency, and, and Parks. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1704 and 1705, please? Docket number 1704, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $250,000 in the form of a grant for fiscal year 23 COPS accreditation project awarded by the United States Department of Justice to be administered by the police department. The grant will fund accreditation process through the purchase of power DMS to document objective evidence of CLEA and P MPAC requirements. And docket number 1705, message in order authorizing the city of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $47,890.47 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 22 fire prevention and safety grant program awarded by the Federal Emergency Management Agency to be administered by the fire department. The grant will fund the purchase of an evidence management system and necessary supporting items and provide one-time training to personnel of the fire investigation unit on the use of the system. Thank you. These two dockets, 1704, 1705, will be referred to the Committee on Public Safety, Criminal Justice. 
Mr. Kirk, can you please read dockets 1706 to 1711, please? Docket number 1706, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Peter Sanborn as a member of the South End Landmark District Commission for a term expiring on June 30th, 2025. Docket number 1707, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of John Freeman as a member of the South End Landmark District Commission for a term expiring June 30th, 2025. Docket number 1708, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Christopher DeBoard as a member of the South End Landmark District Commission for a term expiring June 30th, 2025. Docket number 1709, Message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Nancy Russell as a member of the St. Patolf Architectural Commission for a term expiring November 10th, 2026. Docket number 1710, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Jim Cutchin as a member of the St. Patolf Architectural Commission for a term expiring on November 10th, 2026. And docket number 1711, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Douglas Miller as a member of the St. Badolf Architectural Commission for a term expiring on November 10, 2026. Thank you. These dockets 1706, 1707, 1078, 1079, 10, 1710, 1711. These dockets will be referred to the Committee on Planning, Development, Transportation. We're on to reports of public offices and others. Uh, Mr. Kirk, can you ensure that the record is reflected? Council Lara is present. And if you can read dockets 1712 through 1720. Docket number 1712, notice of receipt from the mayor of the appointment of Councilor Sharon Durkin as ex officio trustee of the Boston Groundwater Trust. Docket number 1713. Notice was received from the mayor the appointment of Nick Pittman as a trustee of the Boston Groundwater Trust for a term expiring on November 2nd, 2025. Docket number 1714. Notice was received from the mayor the appointment of Beatrice Nesson as a trustee of the Boston Groundwater Trust for a term expiring on November 2nd, 2025. Docket number 1715. Notice was received from the mayor the appointment of Chaton Green as a member of the Boston Employment Commission for a term expiring on October 26, 2025. Docket number 1716. Notice was received from the mayor of the appointment of Nigel Jacobs as a member of the Boston Arts Commission for a term expiring November 15, 2028. Docket number 1717. Notice was received from the mayor of the appointment of James Mason as a member of the Boston Arts Commission for a term expiring November 15, 2028. Docket number 1718. Notice was received from the mayor the appointment of Abigail Norman as a member of the Boston Arts Commission for a term expiring on November 15, 2028. Docket number 1719. Notice was received from the mayor the appointment of Sonal Gandhi as a member of the Boston Cannabis Commission for a term expiring November 10, 2025. And docket number 1720. Notice was received from the city clerk in accordance with chapter 6 of the ordinances of 1979 relative to action taken by the mayor and papers acted upon by the city council at its meeting on October 25th, 2023. Thank you. These dockets 1712 through 1720, these dockets will be placed on file. We're on to reports of committees. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket? 0455, please. Docket number 0455, the Committee on Government Operations to which was referred on March 1st, 2023. Docket number 0455, an ordinance amending the City of Boston Code relating to the study and report on the trafficking of illegal firearms. Submits a report recommending that the ordinance ought to pass in an amended draft. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council Arroyo, the Chair of the Committee on Government Operations. Council Arroyo, you have Th the floor. Thank you. Uh, the Committee on Government Operations held a virtual working session on Thursday, November 9th at 10 a.m. on docket 0455, referred to the committee on March 1st, 2023, and sponsored by Council President Flynn and Councilor Brian Worrell. 
I'd like to thank my council colleagues, Councilor Rusi Louis Jen, Councilor Aaron Murphy, and Council Michael Flaherty for attending, uh, along with the sponsors. Uh, I would also like to thank the administration for attending, Gerald Cahill, Bureau of Intelligence and Analysis and, uh, from the Boston Police. I am Paul McLaughlin, Bureau of Investigative Services from the Boston Police, and Ryan Walsh uh, from the Boston Regional Intelligence Center uh, from the Boston Police Department. Uh, this proposal would amend the City of Boston Code of Ordinances by adding a new section that would require the Boston Police Department to annually study and create a report on the trafficking of illegal firearms into the City of Boston. The study and report would compile data on the flow of firearms and review ways that illegal firearms are transported into the city in order to help law enforcement and policymakers determine ways to decrease and end the flow of illegal firearms into the city of Boston. The ordinance requires the Boston Police Department to coordinate with law enforcement and other municipal entities and submit the report to the city council. The ordinance identifies certain information to be collected and included in the report, but also includes provisions on limitations of disclosure uh, to protect both police and the public. Uh, from uh, instances where that, that disclosure is not allowed. Uh, during the November 9th working session, we reviewed the language of the docket by section and based upon information gathered at the hearing and the working session, the following changes have been made. The Boston Public Health Commission is now designated to receive a report, uh, the same report on the study addressing the reduction of firearm influx into the city within three months of passage uh, and annually thereafter. Uh, we change shall to when available, recognizing that there are pieces of information that the Boston Police Department would need to get from state, county, and federal entities, uh, and at times may not be able to receive. Uh, the amendment mandates the disclosures of individuals' ages possessing guns, if, uh, if that's accessible information. Uh, and in reporting, subsection 2, ways has been substituted with trends at the request of the Boston Police Department uh, for enhanced data reliability. Furthermore, the Boston Police Department can provide policy recommendations and key takeaways in the reports on gun trafficking. Uh, and today, I ask that we suspend and pass this docket. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Council Royal. The chair recognizes Council Worrell. Council Worrell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Council President Flynn, and I. Just want to thank all my colleagues for their work um, on this, especially Council President Flynn for being the lead sponsor, and thank you, Council Royal, for chairing the hearing in the working session. Um, I believe that this ordinance not only gets us closer to addressing gun violence in our communities, but reinforces our commit commitment to evidence-based policymaking. Uh, earlier this year, the Boston Public Health Commission released a report showing that the leading cause of death among Boston kids, kids ages 1 through 17 was homicide. There are too many kids in our city who are dying from gun violence. There are too many parents worrying every time their kid leaves the house. There are too many tragic stories about a kid being struck by a stray bullet and lives too, taken too soon. We need to act. These reports will provide the data. We need to best craft policies that will make a real impact. We will find out exactly how these guns are getting into our neighborhoods and how these cycles of violence begin. As a representative of a district that has some of the highest rates of gun violence in the city, we know that our current approach is not providing the relief our residents demand. I've been working with residents, colleagues, and the mayor's office to explore solutions backed by data so we can best address the root causes of violence. This amended ordinance introduces changes that will, that will empower us to build policies and advocacy against gun violence that are nuanced, targeted, and effective. I want to thank the BPD in advance for compiling this annual report and for the expected collaboration from the Massachusetts State Police, the Suffolk County Sheriff's Office, Boston Public Health Commission, the <coughs> Suffolk County District Attorney's Office, and other stake, stakeholders. Uh, Thirteen months ago, with the leadership of Council President Ed Flynn, uh, this body declared gun violence to be a public health emergency. And now I want to thank my colleagues for taking another step forward to addressing it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Worrell. I'm not going to add anything to this other than to say thank you to my colleagues, especially Council Worrell, for the important leadership he provided in addressing this issue in his ongoing efforts on gun violence and safe and healthy neighborhoods. So thank you to Council Worrell. I also want to say thank you to Councilor 
Arroyo, chair of the chair of the committee for his leadership, I want to say thank you to my city council colleagues and the Boston police as well. Council Arroyo seeks acceptance of the committee report in an amended draft in passage of docket 0555. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Docket 050455 has passed in an amended draft. We're on to matters recently heard for possible action. Mr. Clerk, would you read docket 0944? Docket number 0944, order implementing an anti-bullying policy for the Boston City Council. <clears throat> Council Flynn, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council Royal. <clears throat> Docket 0944 is an order on anti-bullying policy for the Boston City Council. If you can bear with me as I as I read the report and including information gathered at working sessions and the summary of the amendments that were, were provided. But basically this docket 0944, it's in order that the city council would adopt an anti-bullying policy for city councilors staff. Such policy is meant to affirm that the city council does not condone bullying and sets expectations for workplace conduct. The Committee on Rules and Administration, we held three working sessions on this docket on August 10th, on September 8th, and November 14th. At the August 10th working session, the Chair provided background on the filing, noting the intent to hold multiple working sessions on the draft policy prior to bringing this docket to a vote. Councils in attendance provided opening remarks expressing support for the concept of a code of professional conduct and setting standards for the body and the importance of mental health and support resources for staff as well. Concerns raised about the docket included the extent of content, how to design a specific process and determine and apply consequences, concerns about interactions should issues arrive between councilors and other council staff, whether application of a policy would apply outside City Hall, for example, on social media or in the press or at civic association meetings, and or how to separate a verbal and written criticism of councilors from that of staff. City councilors and staff shared experiences with this issue. The working session proceeded through the draft policy section by section for discussion and input. Council has stated that in order for the city council to be effective, the environment needs to be safe. Council has talked about how the council environment has changed over time, how to get to a place where the environment is safe and comfortable for all employees, the ability to have heated debate without, without it being personal, the negative effect of COVID-19 had on the workplace, feelings of difficult working environments, how to weigh the fact that much of the council's work is done outside the building, how politics can spill over into social media, including when supporters might get involved as well. Council has also acknowledged that enforcement is an issue. Regarding the policy statement, discussions continued, including possible difficulties with enforcement, given that each council office operates somewhat independently, whether the council should opt into usage of the city's human resources and standards for progressive discipline. The unique structure of council HR was explained. Inquiries were raised about how other city council handled their HR. Other possible resources included the National League of Cities, Massachusetts Municipal Association, 
it was agreed that formal steps and decision makers would have to decide upon. It was noted that for central staff, discipline matters have traditionally gone through the Committee of the Whole. It was further noted that a policy may have to distinguish certain policies and procedures for central staff separate from City Council office staff. Further, further discussion focused on expectations. It was noted that HR does not have the same jurisdiction over elected officials that would, as it would have on other city employees. It was stressed that a policy need to have a specific definition that all councils can agree on. The difficulty of the political environment, particular difficulties um, for all colleagues in the impact of social media, the high degree of disagreement that can manifest, unfortunately, on the council floor and the fact that many people <coughs> acknowledge being bullied at, at various stages. Discussions further continued on how the council can work to change how people see, respect, and value each other. The committee noted that council is our public fi figures and that staff is not. Regarding the definition of bullying, it was recommended changes in the areas of discussion included extending the policy to cover behavior inside and outside the workplace, including a list of actions that are acceptable or a list of decorum rules that state inappropriate behavior while preserving the ability to disagree and debate. It continues clarifying the structural procedure for conflict and discipline between council office, such as that a council cannot confront another council staff, needing a definition for reasonable person in the first paragraph, acknowledging the difference between disagreeing, being passionate, and bullying, how to separate policy discussions, deliberations, political posture, Considerations raised include that signing onto a matter can signal support for someone's right to bring a matter to the floor, even if there is a disagreement about the content. Acknowledging cultural difference, differences in interpretation of certain behaviors and how to respect them without each person having to share what accommodations they may need. Again, focusing on a procedure for addressing possible misunderstandings or bullying. National issues with social media abuse and racial tensions were also discussed. Reckoning with how to allow difficult conversations and listening without reacting, how to adjust for and appreciate cultural differences. Importance of separating out manager employee expectations and managerial prerogative from bullying. Issues of quiet quitting in negative work climate, emotional bullying, suggestions of ensuring better understanding were also discussed. It was agreed that councilors would need to buy in to any rules and procedures put forward. The next section regarding notification and complaints, the discussion continued, which included whether there should be a designated point person, that the importance of including the council president and ensuring the policy does not create unintended consequences. It was noted that both sections would need further work and discussion. So we're going on to the September 8th working session next. The chair reviewed the minutes from the August 10th working session and highlighted its main points. The focus of this working session was enforcement. Council has discussed the different levels of staff and expectations, as well as the difference between city council office staff and central staff. Council has discussed that each Council office runs separately. Council has discussed the role of the council president versus other councilors. Council also discussed the separation of the city council and the city's office of human resources. Council has discussed repairing the harm that has been done regarding racial relations and racial tensions in the city. Council has agreed that deliberating on the city council is acceptable and should not be part of that policy. Council has discussed how to address complaints. Discussion included stating in-house, reaching out to human resources, 
conducting investigations, having independent mediation, the 2018 City Council harassment and discrimination policy, the difference between elected officials and staff. Council has noted that is an important discussion relating to how the City Council functions as a body. Now, the November 14th working session. Council has discussed points from the previous working session and reviewed suggestions, changes to the policy. The chair provided an overview of some of the main issues discussed, which included difficulties with enforcement of a potential anti-bullying policy, the fact that the city council is unique, is a unique entity composed of elected officials and their offices, where each councilor makes decisions on hiring and termination for their own office, and the fact that the city of Boston's human resources department does not have direct jurisdiction over the Boston City Council in the same way it does other departments, as we discussed during the first working session. The chair reviewed suggestion, suggested changes made to the docket, which included removing complaint procedures and notification requirements, and explained that this new draft would also incorporate suggestions from colleagues from the two previous working sessions clarifying sentences, and removing potentially confusing ones. All employees would need to sign and acknowledge that the workplace bullying is not tolerated. The <coughs> chair clarified that future councils would be able to use this policy as a starting, to, spot, starting point to expand upon. Councils reviewed the amended docket section by section and made language suggestions to clarify definitions of bullying Examples of bullying intent. Council has discussed the definition of bullying behavior, reviewed the examples of what could be considered bullying. Council has discussed human resources policies and the possibility of including such policies by reference, as well as the overlap between bullying behavior and other legal causes of action. Council has discussed the impact of bullying on the staff and the importance of staff <coughs> and counselor access to mental health resources and support services. Councils agree that the language about promoting the integrity of the city council as a body in language regarding having respect for the institution of the city council be included in the intro introduction section. Council has discussed the implementation of the policy including the acknowledgement forms and training so that employees are aware of the policy. Council has discussed including information about outside complaint systems such as MCAD, Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination, Discrimination and EEOC, and ensuring staff awareness or access to resources. Based on the information gathered at these three working sessions, the order was simplified by removing various sections and bullets to clarify intent and remove places of possible contention or confusion. The end result is meant to be a value statement for the City Council that serves as a first step in addressing bullying in our workplace. The committee chair recommended action. As, committee, as chair of the Committee on Rules and Administration, I recommend moving the listed docket from the committee to the full council for discussion in formal action. At this time, my recommendation to the full, full council will be that this matter ought to pass in a new draft. Is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? Just a question. Uh, normally I would go through the chair to the, to the maker, but uh, is it accurate that this is just a value statement? It does not include a complaint mechanism, an internal complaint mechanism? That's accurate, Council Royal. Thank you. That's, uh, would anyone else uh, like to speak on this matter? Do we just go to a... Oh, yep. uh, may the record reflect that uh, we've been joined by Councilor Braden. Uh, are you calling for a roll call vote? No. Uh, in that case, uh, chair is looking for a vote today uh, on this matter. All in favor, say aye. 
Aye. Aye. All, all opposed say nay. Hearing none in opposition, uh, docket number is this? Docket 17. 09, docket 0944 has now passed in a new amended version. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Council Royal. To motions, orders, and resolutions. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1721? Docket number 1721, Council Alaro, for the following Petition for a special law regarding an act relative to voting for all legal residents in the city of Boston. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council Alaro. Council Alaro, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and thank you um, for indulging me. It looks like my um, my dockets are the only ones on the agenda today, so I will not keep you here long. In the United States, we believe in a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. But instead of bringing us closer to a more complete representative democracy, we the people has been narrowly defined, used to further the ruling class interests and deny civil rights to historically marginalized communities. In Boston alone, over 40,000 immigrants are disenfranchised by our current voting laws. Unfortunately, this exclusion from the proverbial we isn't unique to our immigrant communities. We don't give young people voice in choosing their representatives. People who are incarcerated are stripped of their access to the ballot. And our unwillingness to implement common sense policies like same day registration deter our constituents from participating in the electoral process. If we want to create a truly representative municipal government, we must commit to expanding our electorate deepening our definition of democracy, and ultimately bringing those in the margins to the center. Every place where we see our neighbors excluded from power offers us a unique opportunity to address barriers and builds a stronger social democracy. We the people, all the people, should have the power to elect our representatives and fully participate in every decision, discussion, and deliberation that impacts our daily lives. I shared these words in this chamber the very first time that I addressed my colleagues and the city of Boston as a counselor. They ring truer today than they did two years ago. And this is why I'm proud to present this home petition for the consideration of this honorable body today. After hearings, talks at the Kennedy School, meetings with mayors and city councilors from half a dozen cities across the country, and conversations with advocates, lawyers, and my city council colleagues, they have all reaffirmed that the impact of and the need to enfranchise legal residents in our city. According to a 2018 report from the Boston Planning and Development Authority, there are 68,000 immigrants with legal status in Boston. Immigrants make a significant contribution to Boston's economy by participating in the labor force and paying taxes. In 2018, the ACS found that immigrants in Suffolk County paid $2.1 billion in taxes and had approximately $5.4 billion in spending power. So immigrants, particularly those with legal status, pay taxes and contribute to Boston's economy. They're not able to participate in the electoral process in what I believe is a violation of one of our foundational American principles. At least 15 municipalities all across the country and five right here in Massachusetts have already restored voting rights for legal residents and with a handful more moving it through their legislative process. By moving this homo petition forward, Boston can begin the process of making good on our promise to build a city that is for everyone. We'll be holding a hearing in the coming weeks, and I hope that I can earn my colleagues' support on this transformative policy. Thank you. Thank you, Council Laura. Is anyone looking to speak on this matter? The Chair recognizes Council Royal. Council Royal, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Councilor Flynn. I want to thank uh, Council Laura for putting this forward. I know my father put something similar forward. I believe Councillor Flaherty was actually part of that council and may have even voted in support of it. It was similar. Uh, so this has my support. It's not a new idea. I think when my father was proposing it, it was somewhat new. Uh, now it's not that new. I believe cities as large as Chicago and New York uh, have implemented or attempted to implement this. Uh, last I checked, I think we had a hearing on this earlier in this year, if I'm not mistaken, and I think it's somewhere above 50 
cities in the country already do this. Uh, it's important, I think, to give voice to uh, folks locally uh, who are providing and are subject to all manner of municipal decisions. Um, much of our immigrant community is involved in our small businesses, uh, is involved in our school system. Uh, they deserve a right to be heard on a local level. Uh, and certainly this is not a, a new idea. Um, I think we have the ability to do this correctly. I believe in our elections department. I believe in the city of Boston. I also think when we look at turnout numbers, uh, we should be trying as much as possible to engage our populations, whether they be uh, folks who are here with paperwork or born natural citizens, uh, or folks who are here documented working their way through uh, our, our system towards uh, full citizenship. Uh, and so this has my support. Please add my name. Thank you. Thank you, Council Royo. The chair recognizes Councilor Durkin. Council Durkin, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Councilor Laura, for putting this forward. Um, as someone who uh, has just run for office uh, two times in the last six months, I can tell you that it's heartbreaking when you pass out literature in four languages and people respond back in, in whatever language they speak. I can't vote, um, and I um, and and therefore they feel less a part of the process. So, I'm excited to explore this, um, and please add my name. Thank you, Councilor Dorkin. The chair recognizes Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Boston's uh, growing uh, diversity and the level of community div uh, involvement that we see uh, in all of our neighborhoods makes our city great. Uh, we love New Bostonians, and it's been an honor and a privilege to to serve um, New Bostonians and the entire city as their at-large counselor. Um, however, there are strong um, and legitimate legal concerns that we need to be mindful of when we talk about um, granting uh, non-citizens the right to vote. Um, as referenced, uh, as the chair of the Committee on Government Operations, during prior council terms, uh, I had held uh, several hearings to discuss allowing uh, immigrants with legal status to vote in municipal elections and to also examine other inclusive practices. The council, um, several um, renditions of councilors, heard valuable testimony from a variety of stakeholders, including Veronica Serrato, uh, highly recognized and widely respected uh, immigration attorney, who's also the executive director of Project Citizenship, which is the largest citizenship uh, provider in New England. And Director Serrato testified that allowing immigrants to vote in municipal elections may have uh, several unintended, unintended consequences, explaining that non-citizens who mistakenly register to vote or who vote in federal or state elections seriously jeopardize their opportunity to become a legal citizen. And in fact, permanently bar them from that opportunity. Uh, also uh, referenced in those hearings was the predatory and unscrupulous behavior of employers holding that over uh, their employees' heads, as well as uh, family dynamics and domestic violence, uh, uh, as well as relationship situ situations, calling that into questions, and, and again, in a more predatory manner. And, and just lastly, uh, the U New York Supreme Court has just struck down um, the New York City Council's attempt to allow non-citizens to vote in municipal elections, uh, holding in that decision that only U.S. citizens have uh, the privilege of voting. So uh, need to find a way through this. Uh, we need to be continue to be inviting uh, and welcoming to new Bostonians. We need to encourage uh, all of that community involvement and participation uh, in taking those steps, again, to be as inclusive as possible. Uh, but there are some very serious ramifications in situations where uh, a non-citizen could mistakenly register to vote uh, and or vote in a federal election, not distinguishing between a city council election in an election for state rep or for state senate or in a president's election. So there are some inherent dangers that were outlined in a number of hearings uh, through prior council sessions, uh, and I had a front row seat as the chair of government operations for all of those. So I just want to raise that, uh, that, that red flag uh, in, and highlight uh, the role that Veronica Serrato, nobody does it better, uh, no one has fought more fights uh, for immigrants uh, in court as a lead immigration attorney but also as the lead uh, and largest uh, citizen, citizenship provider in New England uh, as her role as the Executive Director of Project Citizenship. So I just want to throw caution uh, on the floor uh, to my colleagues, uh, particularly the newer members who hadn't participated in prior council sessions and hearings that 
uh, there is a slippery slope here that uh, needs to be front and center during the course of this hearing. So look forward uh, to that hearing. Uh, would encourage through the chair that the lead sponsor invite uh, Director Serrato uh, and or other uh, assembly situated um, leaders, frankly, either on the immigration uh, trial attorney side that they see things happening, as well as uh, immigrant organizations that help new Bostonians uh, getting acclimated and providing and, and, and connecting them to services, as well as colleagues here that have great relationships in their respective communities uh, with their residents, with their constituents, with new Bostonians, and in continuing to encourage them uh, to be involved, to participate, and to engage, but also make sure that you know we're not putting someone in harm's way and barring them from permanent citizenship because they didn't uh, distinguish between the elections or they got a robocall to go out and vote or someone knocked on their door and drove them to the polls uh, in an effort to try to increase voter turnout in a particular neighborhood uh, that could have uh, lasting, uh, permanent lasting uh, impacts to that individual and their family. So uh, look forward to the hearing, Mr. President. Thank you, Thank you Council Flaherty. Um, the Chair recognizes Councilor Louis Jean, and after Councilor Louis Jean, I'm going to give Councilor Laura the opportunity um, to have the final statement on this matter, unless my colleagues still want to weigh in that have, haven't spoken yet. But at this time, the Chair recognizes Councilor Louis Jean. Councilor Louis Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. And I'm chiming in just as the last person who chaired a hearing on this topic as the Chair of Civil Rights and Immigrant Advancement. We held a hearing. Um, I don't know if it was this year or last year, but it was a pretty uh, robust hearing, and there were members here from Lawyers for Civil Rights um, who talked about uh, the legality of this and how actually it was only um, until recently that we've become more restrictive on who actually has the right to vote, whether we're talking about um, uh, enfran enfranchisement of those with a, a felony or we're talking about uh, non-citizen voting. I think uh, some of the concerns that have been mentioned, when we look at the jurisdictions, especially in Maryland or in California and other places where non-citizen voting, whether it be for a school board or in a local election, has been uh, the, way of, uh, the way of local elections happening. There's a lot to learn for making sure that uh, enfranchising non-citizen voters doesn't lead to further repercussions. So it's not like we would be inventing something that hasn't happened or that hasn't worked in other jurisdictions, or that hasn't been vetted by legal uh, uh, by legal courts. I think the difference when we're looking at New York, and when, we're, when we even talked about it in this hearing here, is a mechanism by which you make the decision on granting non-citizen voting, right? And so that is really where the crux of the work is. What is the path that you make that possible? How are you comparing languages that exist in state constitutions? What does our Constitution say versus the Constitution of other states where this has been made permissible? What has been the mechanism to make that permissible from a legal standpoint? And it was a very robust conversation that we had from both an academic perspective, a legal perspective, and one that I hope that we will continue here uh, to ensure that we can enfranchise all of our voters here in the city, all of our residents here in the city of Boston. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Luijan. Before I go to Council Laura, any councilors uh, want to speak now? The chair, recognize, the chair recognizes Council Braden. Council Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. This issue is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I came to Boston in 1995 on a visa. I was a legal, a legal immigrant. Um, and I've, I came to Boston. I, I, I wasn't intending to stay, but I ended up staying and um, got very involved in community and electoral politics right from the get-go. Uh, working on campaigns, so it took me 12 years to get my citizenship. Um, there's many, many folks in our communities who are immigrants, they're not uh, fully uh, citizens yet, and they're very, very engaged. And uh, it's a very sad state of affairs in our country that it's so difficult for people who want to bring their whole, their whole effort and their whole energy to be, be fully um, enfranchised citizens and, and community members in, in Boston or anywhere in the country that we put so many barriers in their way to becoming full citizenship, citizens and fully participating in our democracy. Um, you know, I think we have a lot of, we, we lament the very low turnout in, in Boston and in our neighborhoods. Um, and you know, in this recent election, it came to my uh, awareness that 
you know, we have a lot of work to do to educate our electorate, even those folks who are fully full citizens who are immigrants, English is not their first language, uh, even just understanding uh, the civic proce procedures and, and uh, what elections are. Like, there was confusion about can I vote for an at-large person and vote for a district person? Is it, they do, there's two elections. There's, there was a lot of confusion and a lot of, um, there's a huge amount of uh, education that we need to do to fully enfranchise and empower the folks that are already citizens to participate fully in our democracy. I, I really welcome the, 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 the conversation. I think this is an important issue to address. Um, but um, I just feel that as an immigrant myself, it was a, a rocky and difficult and an expensive way for me to get to be a citizenship. But I, I, I came with a profession. I was hired to work in Boston University Hospital, Boston Medical Center. I, I speak English. I had huge advantages over so many other um, immigrants. Um, but we shouldn't be making it more difficult for people to participate. We should be smoothing the way and making it easier for people to participate and be fully engaged in our civic life. And the other piece of this, I think, is a very, very important to have improved more civic education and civics right from, right from elementary school through high school so that folks understand what our democracy is about and how they can participate even from a very early age. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. The chair recognizes Council Lara and Council Lara would you be able to kind of weave in a little bit the comments from Council Flaherty about in potentially inviting some civil rights leaders, including project citizenship, to the hearing? The chair recognizes Council Lara. Council Lara, you have the floor. Thank you so much, President Flynn, and I want to thank my, my council colleague, Councillor um, Flaherty, for his comments and also his support of this legislation um, on, on the council in previous years. Uh, when I gave my maiden speech, Councillor Flaherty brought um, similar concerns to me based on his experience on the council and with this kind of legislation. And so I made it a point to make it um, the center of my conversations when I was meeting with elected officials, whether it be mayors or city councillors in other cities who have implemented this, um, because I wanted to like Councillor Lujan mentioned, look at the places that have already implemented this. We don't want to reinvent the wheel and ask them how they really um, ensured that we weren't putting our immigrant communities at risk, how it was implemented in a way that made it safe for people. I think here, this body has also had the conversation recently about giving municipal right to vote for 16 and 17 year olds. And in that hearing, we had a conversation with the elections department where they also talked about creating separate voting roles uh, and separate um, registration documents and even uh, ballots for people so that federal and state elections are not even included in the paper that they would be using to vote. So there are numerous ways that other cities and the city of Boston have come up with ways to ensure that we are protecting uh, our immigrant communities, particularly people who are not eligible to vote in federal elections. Uh, this home rule petition particularly gives the power to the uh, elections commission to really decide what the process looks like. Uh, I want to echo Councilor Arroyo's sentiments that I trust the elections department. Obviously, this body will be involved um, in developing whatever that process looks like and we'll be able to give our feedback. I invite Councilor Flaherty's recommendation for a panelist. I'm happy to um, invite this person here, um, Director Serrano if I have the name correctly, to come and testify. I think on the, um, the comment, particularly around New York City, is that one of the issues with New York City is that, like Massachusetts, New York City is a home rule petition state. And the city council from New York, instead of filing a home rule petition, actually passed an ordinance, which is why um, they you know, brought themselves up to, to some legal scrutiny and it had to be brought up to the Supreme Court. There are also other arguments that are being made uh, about what the New York Constitution says about whether or not it gives people the right to vote in the affirmative or if it says that certain people cannot vote and so on and so forth. And I think that that is still being handled in court, but I do believe that we are in a distinctly different position. We are following the home rule uh, petition route, which means that we're going to be doing it appropriately. And even though, even if the state of Massachusetts Constitution remains the same, this home rule petition would allow us, in spite of what the Constitution says, to restore municipal voting rights to people who have legal status. So I know that there are a lot of questions. I think that we're not reinventing the wheel. We are uh, implementing things that have been implemented all over the country, and I know that a lot of these questions will, one, be answered uh, throughout the hearing process, and I look forward 
to really hear uh, from my council colleagues their questions and their input because I think it is going to ultimately make this home rule petition stronger and better for everybody in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Council Laura. Would anyone like to add their name? Mr. Clerk, please add Council Arroyo, Council Braden, Council Coletta, Council Dirk, and Council Luijan, Council Rell. This docket 1721 will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1722, please? Docket number 1722, Council Lara for the following. Order for a hearing to discuss a guaranteed basic income program for families living below the poverty line in the city of Boston. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Lara. Council Lara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. In his 1967 book, Where Do We Go From Here, Dr. King spoke candidly about the solution to poverty. The solution to poverty, King wrote, is to abolish it directly by a now widely discussed measure, the guaranteed income. Almost 60 years later, guaranteed income programs have taken a hold in every continent and in over 50 cities all across the United States. Poverty has been associated with various health risks, including elevated heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, cancer, infant mortality, mental illness, undernutrition, asthma, and many more. When we neglect to address these harsh realities, we relegate our constituents to fighting these battles alone. Dr. Martin Luther King called for a guaranteed income as the simplest and most effective solution to poverty, noting that its myriad of benefits will cause many positive psychological changes and will inevitably result in widespread economic security. Despite the city of Boston's relatively high median income of $71,834 per household, the bottom 20% of Boston households, or approximately 137,000 people, live on an average income of only $14,000 a year, which is well below the federal poverty line for a family of two. The childhood poverty rate here in one of the richest cities in the country is almost 30%. And I wanna take a moment to highlight that not because this is included in my remarks, but because I heard Councillor Worrell's comments earlier uh, where he stated that the leading cause of death for children from one to age of 17 was homicide. And the reason why that impacted me so deeply and this statistic that the childhood poverty rate in the city is almost at 30% is just a reminder that we are failing our children. We are failing our children and it is death by a thousand cuts. It is a series of small individual policy decisions that we're making that are really making it incredibly hard for our most vulnerable constituents to thrive in this city. And this statistic, along with the one that Councillor Worrell shared, um, really brought that home for me today. And so I just wanted to take a moment to make a connection because it is astonishing to me that we live in one of the wealthiest countries in the world and yet we've stood idly by for so long in the face of one of the most pressing and ongoing issues of our time. A universal basic income can economically stabilize and support individuals and families while improving living standards and quality of life. Poverty is associated with all of these health risks mentioned above. And when we neglect to address these harsh realities, we're, really in, we're, we're not giving everybody their best shot. For the last year, my office, in collaboration with the Cabinet for Economic Opportunity and Inclusion, has um, convened a guaranteed basic income a guaranteed basic income coalition and this coalition was comprised of members of the human services cabinet the economic opportunity and inclusion cabinet the office of equity and inclusion the office of arts and culture the office of black male advancement and boston public schools in this coalition we met twice a month for the better part of a year and we created a proposal for a basic income pilot that would serve at least a thousand families here in the city of boston my hope is that this hearing order will create a space for the council to be updated on all of the work that we've done in the last year to hear from the administration about what their path forward is to create a guaranteed basic income program for our most needy families in the city. This is not just a conversation that we're having about money. This is a conversation about economic security, public health, and defending those who have continued to struggle due to our own inability to enact substantial long-lasting change. When I took this office, I swore to stand for those who have not had the opportunity to stand for themselves. And this is just another step towards that goal. I hope that all my council colleagues will join me at this hearing so that we can hear an update on the state of the proposal that the coalition put forward and continue to do the work of supporting the constituents of the city of Boston. Thank you. Thank you, Council Laura. Would anyone like to speak on this matter? 
Would anyone like to sign on to this matter? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Council of Royal, Council of Braden, Council of Coletta, Council of Eugene, Council of Rell. This stock at 1722 will be referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Mr. Clerk, can you, can you add Council of Durkin also? <coughs> We're on to personnel orders. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1723, please? Docket number 1723, Council of Flint for Council of Finance. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this docket. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This docket is passed. We're on to late file matters. Okay. I've been informed by the clerk that there were seven late file matters, including in the seven late file matters is an absent letter from Council of Mejia, an absent letter from Council Fernandez Anderson, four personnel orders, a resolution from Council Flynn. Um, we will now take a vote to add these late file matters into the agenda. All those in favor of adding these late file into the agenda, please say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. <coughs> the ayes have it. The late files have been added. Mr. Clerk, can, can we do my late file first? Um, because I, I want to recognize some special guests that are here as well. Offered by Councillor Ed Flynn, resolution in support of the Seaport Hotel Banquet Workers, whereas the banquets and convention services workers at the Seaport Hotel Boston are ambassadors for the city of Boston and feed thousands of guests for countless community organizations and causes every year. Now, now therefore, be it ordered the city council go on record expressing support for the banquets and convention services workers at the Seaport Hotel and call on the hotel owner Fidelity to let the banquet workers vote in a free and fair union election. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The chair recognizes Councillor Flynn. Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Th thank you, Council Braden. In July 2023, the Seaport Hotel banquet workers petitioned to join Unite Here Local 26, the Hospitality Employees Union. Yet, since then, the Seaport Hotel has delayed the vote through legal maneuvers. Before I continue, I do want to recognize the working men and women of Local 26 that are here right now. Thank you for being with us. Usually the first people that tourists see in the city of Boston, or meet I should say, are people from the hotels or the restaurants. And these dedicated and professional workers represent what's great about this city. Hard work, determination, the welcoming attitude towards, towards visitors. But we need to support our hotel workers because they've always supported us and ensure that they can unionize when they choose to. During the pandemic, when many people had to work from home or were working from home, hotel workers were at the hotel doing their job. So I hope that the city council can go on record expressing support for the banquet and convention service workers at the Seaport Hotel, which is in District 2, and call on the hotel owner Fidelity, one of the wealthiest companies in the world, to let the banquet workers vote in a free and fair union election. I hope we can suspend and pass this today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. And thank you, President Flynn. Um, would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Councillor Durkin? You have the floor. Thank you so much, Council President Flynn, for bringing this forward. All workers um, who are working in this hotel deserve a contract. While it's not my district, I can tell you that uh, hotel workers work throughout my district, and they do a wonderful, incredible job. And Local 26 also represents um, other workers in my district. So I just want to uh, thank the Council for taking this on, thank the Council President for spearheading this. And I, I will join you in, in voting in support of this resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Durkin. Anyone else? Councillor Louis Jean? 
Thank you. I just wanted to just rise in support of Local 26 and want to thank President Flynn for filing this and for your leadership consistently on representing Local 26 and the Seaport um, Hotel. I was out at a rally with you all and I'm happy that we've got here. So congratulations. Thank you, Councillor Louis Jean. Anyone else like Councillor Flaherty? You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just rise and support, please add my name, and also just to personally thank uh, the Hotel Workers Union, Local 26, as I knew when I started in the business, but also now an idea uh, for your many, many years, over 20 years of support. Uh, it's been a, a pleasure and an honor to serve your members, but also the partnership that we've had uh, across the city, uh, not just this hotel, but other hotels, making sure that uh, the wages, the benefits, the conditions are safe uh, and then allow you uh, to provide for your families and Hopefully it's just one job and not requiring you to have a second and a third job. So it's been a pleasure to work with your leadership, and it's more importantly a pleasure to work with each and every one of your members at the hotels, at events that we all attend. Make sure that we say hello to our hotel workers as always on the first order of business. Thank you for your participation. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Flaherty. Anyone like to add their name? Councillor Royal, Councillor Baker, Councillor Coletta, Councillor Durkin, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Lara, Councillor Louis Jean, Councillor Murphy, Councillor Worrell, and please add my name. Councillor Flynn moves for adoption of this late file of resolution. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say nay. The ayes have it. This docket has been adopted. Thank you. If, if I could take one minute and respectfully ask if the workers here from Local 26 Unite would please come down to the podium with my colleagues for a brief photo, if that's, if that's okay. We're, we're in a brief recess. Back, back in session. Also, like to recognize a another strong union person, my neighbor in South Boston. That's here, John Provenzano. John, thank you for being with us. Mr. Clerk, we're going to continue on the late file matters. Can you please read an absent letter from Council Mejia, please? Dear Council President Flynn, I am writing to inform you of my absence today at the Council meeting. A representative from my staff will be listening in, and I will thoroughly review the video. I ask that you please read this matter into the public record. Thank you, Councillor Julia Mejia. Thank you. Can, uh, the next late file is an absent letter from Council Fernandez Innocent. Dear President Flynn, I hope this message finds you well. I regret to inform you that I will be unable to attend today's City Council meeting. I will review the recording of my records and will follow up with all matters that require my attention or input. Thank you. Uh, 
Sincerely, Councillor Fernando Sanderson. Mr. Clerk, now we're on to the four personnel orders. First personnel order, Councillor Flynn for Councillor Louisiane. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this late file matter. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. This late file matter has been passed. The second late file matter, Mr. Clerk. Councillor Flynn for Councillor Louisiane. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this late file matter. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The, the late file matter has been passed. The third late file matter, Mr. Clerk. Councillor Flynn for Central Staff. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this late file matter. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. This late file matter has passed. The final late file matter. Councilor Flynn for Central Staff. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this late file matter. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This late file matter has passed. The two late file, ma the two absent letters will be placed on file. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. We're on to green sheets. Any council wishing to remove something from the green sheets? The chair recognizes Council Baker. Council Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Can I remove docket number 1284 on page 13 of 18? Mr. Clerk, can you read docket 1284 <coughs> into the record and also we're going to poll the committee to ensure it's properly before the body. From the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation, docket number 1284, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Kate Bennett as a member of the Boston Planning and Development Agency Board for a term expiring September 17, 2027. Mr. Clerk, can you poll the committee, please? The Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation, Councilor Baker. Aye. Councilor Worrell. Yes. Council Braden. Yes. Council Lara. Yes. And Council Flaherty. Yes. Properly. This is properly before the body. The chair recognizes Council Baker. Thank you, Mr. President. This is pretty straightforward. This is <clears throat> the appointment of Kate Bennett as a member of the Boston Planning and Development Agency. Most of us here know Kate and her dedication to the city of Boston and her work as the head of the BHA. And then also before that, she was Billy McGonigal's right-hand person. She's someone that's, that, that cares for the city, is dedicated to the city. I think it's a no-brainer for us to um, approve this. Thank you. Thank you, Council Baker. Council, Ma Council Baker moves for passage of this docket. All those in favor say aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This docket has passed. Anyone else on green sheets? We're on to the consent agenda. Okay. I've been informed by the clerk that there is one addition to the consent agenda. The chair moves for adoption of the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you. The consent agenda has been adopted. We're on to memorials. For Council Flynn and Council Flaherty, James McManus, Sr., Boston Police Department, Alexander Mavridis. For Council Louis Jean, Walter Hill, Clementine Scott, Talika Marie Robertson, who is the aunt of Will Dickerson. Will is with us today. A moment of silence, please. The chair moves that when the council adjourns today, we do so in memory of those individuals we mentioned. And we are now scheduled to meet again in the INL chamber on Wednesday, November 29th at 12 noon. Before we adjourn, I want to say thank you to the clerk, the assistant clerk, my council colleagues and their staff, city council central staff, and to our stenographer who is, who is uh, with us also remotely doing her job. Uh, before we adjourn, I do want to recognize Councilor Coletta. Councilor Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Council President Flynn. I just want to invite all my colleagues to the Lunch and Learn that's happening today. We have Project Bread here to uh, talk about their policy work. They're East Boston based, but we know their work to solve hunger spans across the city and the Commonwealth. So please join us. Thank you. Thank you, Council Coletta.
All in favour of adjournment, please say aye. 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 The Council is adjourned.